This is back to back. Yo, what's up, back to backers? This is Willie Joy. Welcome to the show. This is back to back. This is my podcast. You are listening to it. At least I assume you're listening to it. I mean, it would be weird if you were playing it on mute. And we have gone off the rails about 10 seconds into the show. How are you? How was your week? I hope everybody out there is doing well. I am sitting at home in my studio here in California. It's the middle of October. I'm debating turning on my air conditioning. Uh, That's where I'm at right now. Spent most of the week uh, trying to finish up a new tune. You know, finishing projects, like the last 5% of it. That's not always my favorite part of the process. But, uh, you know, doing this show, doing my Sirius XM show, I have a lot I can kind of switch back and forth on. It keeps the creativity flowing. It keeps the fun going. And uh, speaking of fun, I had a lot of fun with today's guest. My guest on the show is Delta Heavy, or more specifically, Ben, who's one half of the group. He was in town. He came by my spot. We sat on the couch. We had a beer. It was a good time. And I've always been a big fan of Delta Heavy without really knowing anything about them other than their music. They've got a new song out called Exodus. It's out on Monster Cat right now. Heavy, heavy tune. And there's actually an album in the works for next year. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But before I do, let's do some quick plugs. As always, I want to make sure everybody is checking out the Back to Bangers Spotify playlist. I update that list every single week. And if you like this podcast, if you like these conversations, it's a really good companion piece for that. I put in a lot of music from the guests, from myself, and just other songs that we mention in the show. You know, all the little random thrown off asides. I try to pick up some of those, especially the the key ones, the important ones, and I'll put them all in that playlist. So it's going to be a really interesting mix of music. I have a great time putting it together. I think people really like it. I'm going to put the link to that in the description of this episode. So go check that out. And as long as you're clicking on stuff, why not click and subscribe to this show? That way, every single week, a brand new episode shows up at your door, hand-wrapped, hand-delivered by yours truly. I've gotten some funny messages lately, you know, people asking me, why don't you have uh, such and such on the show? And it's actually somebody who's already been on the show. And then I kind of have to just direct them back uh, to go look at all the episodes because they weren't subscribed. So don't let that be you. Let's both save ourselves some time and embarrassment and just subscribe to the show. And the last thing I'm going to say about this is that if you really enjoy this show, if you like it, if you like what I'm doing and you want to support it, the best way you can do that is by helping me spread the word. Make a post about us, tell a friend about us, whatever you're feeling, just, you know, retweet some stupid post that I make, whatever it is, it all really helps boost the show. I've been seeing so many people saying nice things about the show and what we're trying to do here, and it really does help the show overall. I say this a lot, uh, but I really do believe it. This is a community show. I make this show for everybody else. I'm not doing it for myself. And as the show grows, as we get more resources, I'm just going to be able to make it better and better for everybody. So shout out to everybody who's already given your support. And if you see somebody this week who doesn't know about Back to Back, you better let them know. All right. So for this conversation with Delta Heavy, uh, you know, like I said, there was just a good vibe off the bat. We were on the couch. We were drinking a beer. You know, Ben was a great guy, easy to talk to. I love getting the perspective of somebody coming from the UK and doing this kind of music. Because even though I would say the United States is sort of the the home of bass music now, it's definitely where the scene is the biggest. Uh, It didn't really come from here. It, It came, the roots of it came from the UK. And so people from there making this kind of music, I think there's sort of a different perspective, a different approach. And it was cool to kind of dig into that. It was interesting because I didn't really have a lot of references for where he came from and sort of what his background was. But we ended up finding a lot of connections, a lot of sort of similar things in our past. 
a lot of just shared influences, you know, music we loved back in the day, music we love now. I talked to him about, you know, how jealous I am that he's in a duo. When I was starting off, man, I, I wanted to have a partner in crime so bad. Now, I don't know if I really feel that way anymore. I'm probably too much of a control freak, but uh, there are some advantages. And it's interesting to talk about those dynamics. We talked about how they signed to Ram Records, the legendary drum and bass label run by the absolute legend, Andy C., one of my all-time favorite God-level DJs. Talked about, you know, what they're doing for the future. Sounds like they have some big plans coming up. New album next year, bigger tour, some crazy production, some big collabs, you know, all that kind of stuff. We're going to get into all of it right now. Make sure to check them out. I'm going to link in the description of this episode where you can check out Delta Heavy Music, tour dates, everything. Their brand new song, Exodus, which is out right now. And if you follow them, you will not miss the album when it drops next year. So let's get into this right now. I had a great time doing this one. This is me and Delta Heavy back to back. Let's go. I didn't actually realize until we set this up that you and your partner in Delta Heavy perform separately from time to time. I, I was curious about sort of how that evolved for you guys and, and how you feel about, you know, if it's like, I, I guess, because from my perspective, I've always been jealous of duos because I feel like you can just get so much more done, you, the, you can divide the labor. But the only thing is that I would never want to share a DJ set. So in my mind, it seems kind of ideal. Yeah, I mean, it, we first, we kind of went back and forwards uh, DJing together, DJing separately, kind of when we first started out. And it, it, back then it was really like whatever DJ agency we were with, they were like, we, we want you to be both there every show as a consistent act. Sure. And then we had a you know different manager and she was like, I think you should guys should split up and then maybe look to the future to, to do a show, which is a bit more than a DJ set, some kind of you know, live mm. or other kind of enhanced thing. Sure, so when you guys would come together, it would be like a special event. Yeah, and I think, I, I, I don't know, when we were starting out, especially in Europe, we, you know, as everyone, you know, I think maybe apart from some people who are just getting big now, especially in the States, but from, you know, when we were starting out DJing and playing out in Europe, you know, you do your fair fair amount of just, you know, not to the best shows. Yeah. Kind of random small provincial towns in the UK on a Wednesday, <laughs> playing to about 40 people. That said, I still regularly play to like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> everyone still has those shows. So I think that's just part of it. But yeah, so, and you know, we'd, find, we'd found ourselves at some kind of small town in the UK on a Wednesday, both there, kind of thinking, why are we both here? You know, almost, you know, I remember one show, I think it was in this town called High Wycombe. It's a very small town, about an hour from London. God, that's such a good British name. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's classic. It's a classic British. I think, yeah. you know, I think it's actually technically a city because it's got a mm. cathedral. But, okay. I mean, it's got a population of about 30,000. So. Wait, is a cathedral what changes from city to town or town to city? In the, yeah, that's what determines the city, having no a cathedral. Way. So you get very small cities like uh, York has a cathedral. But I mean, population is a lot smaller than a large, you know, right. large town. That that's, is, that's what you learn in geography <laughs> at about age, probably, that probably is age twelve. News to me, man. I wonder. There's got to be some tiny, you know, population one hundred uh, place that just built a cathedral so they could call themselves a city. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's any rules. <laughs> I'm sure there's something. Yeah, in, in, yeah. given uh, UK tradition. But yeah, I mean, so I remember that show. I was literally just sitting on the floor i think on my phone i was like i should just be reading a book or something taking turns and it felt like we were like you know we're both going to be tired tomorrow maybe we could be more productive if one of us did these smaller shows and the other one was in the studio that kind of thing um so since since then we kind of split up to do most of our dj shows i think that was around 2013 okay um so yeah, I mean, there's obviously a lot of benefits to it. You can be in two places at once. Right. And, you know, when you're duo, splitting all the money, you know, you can actually be 
you, you know, can be making double eff- the effective, money. Yeah. yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, people sometimes ask, you know, where, why aren't there two of you there? And it's only since we've done this, our kind of production show in the last 12 months that I felt more confident, I felt more kind of confident and happy to, to do the regular DJ shows sure. as kind of, you know, one man each. Because I think, you know, if you if you can offer something else, either a kind of production, you know, we have the, a kind of big, you know, light show technically. Stage yeah, I, I haven't seen it, so I was going to yeah, ask we're, you. Yeah, we're working on bringing it to North America. Nice. So that's both of us there. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's basically just a, a long, it's a two hour DJ set with a big, big kind of stage thing that sure. we kind of built with um, our VJ and, you know, that it's all controlled and stuff. Um, so, I mean, that, or, you know, we could have a, a live show with, you know, more of a band or something that other acts do. Yeah. So I think having that as the point of difference enables you to have the DJ set. But, you know, I, I still, I worry about a lot of things and I still worry that may, maybe you should, we should be someone like a slander who's two guys at both shows, it's a consistent thing. Sure. Um, Although, some, yeah, sometimes it feels a bit weird. It's like when we're putting up social media content, and it's like one of us there. People are kind of used to it now, and I think there's other acts that do it, so it's quite normal. But there definitely are, yeah. Sometimes I kind of worry that maybe it looked better if we were both there, but, you know. I mean, as long as your fans understand what the deal is, you know, I think it's fine. And especially if you do have that bigger show, then I think it becomes an event when you come back together, and that can get people really excited, you know? Yeah, ex- exactly. And I think it, it kind of it makes doing that more okay. I know there's... I like I know friends who are part of duos, and their you know their name is because obviously we've got Delta Heavy. It's more about you know it's more about the kind of I, I don't like this word, but the brand. Sure. Whereas other acts are so and so and so and so, and I know they've when they've tried to split up too, they've had real problems. Even prize being like you know your yeah Fred Fee and Graphics, good friends of mine. Uh, where's the other guy? <laughs> There's both of you, and they're like I you know my friend Josh Fred Fee and Graphics. He was. He's like, I'm kind of jealous. I wish we'd just chosen one name. Right, right. And, you know, yeah, no one no, really it's, knows. It's the same it's a way. It's a bit more mystique with the, you know. Exactly, man. Yeah, I mean, you guys have been uh, pretty good about not putting your faces as the front of it overall, I think. And I, I was wondering, too, if that was intentional. Because I think, you know, both in musically and visually, I think you guys have a pretty strong aesthetic. But uh, it doesn't really feature you, and I wondered if that was sort of if you prefer being a little more anonymous in that way. I don't. I mean, the whole kind of visual side was always a very, you know, we always intended, always gave that a lot of attention. Um, that's like pers- me personally. I that I kind of spend more time on that. Yeah. So that's more like some of the stuff I come up with. So we always, you know, wanted to be. I even, you know, when we started out, social media wasn't as important and prevalent as it is now, but we still wanted, whether it be our artwork or, you know, our, having a great logo, our music videos, we wanted the visual side to be as, you know, as strong as the music, just to kind of as the, be the complete package. Um, I think the fact that we use kind of artwork and stuff and visuals a bit more than photos is just, <laughs> a, I think, you know, we just, find ourselves cringing at all our press photos. We'd get press shots done a year later to be like, one of us would be like, I hate this one. And we'd be like, oh, I like it. You know, honestly, to going, we'd, ha- we'd have to go through about a folder of 400 photos yeah, yeah. To, to just find 20 that <laughs> we both liked one, like, I like you, I like you on that. Yeah, of And then we have to, you know, to, I, think, I think it's probably 400 to get five that we both are happy with both of our faces and poses and stuff. Yeah, yeah, my hair looks weird in this one. Yeah, he's like, I'm like I've, I look like I've got a double chin. Simon's like, no, you look fine. I'm like, no, 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 it's, we're not using it. I'm deleting it. He's like, no, no, we look, you look fine. He's like, no, I'm deleting it. And yeah. you have to just kind of yeah. let the person have that, that bit of ego. <laughs> of course, man. I mean, I think it's so funny with artists and like, you know, some people, and, and I'm not saying this about you because I'm the same way, but it's like you can get so wrapped up in how you want to be represented and, you know, all these little things that only you are noticing that nobody else is going to yeah, notice. Yeah, totally. I, I, get, I, I think I get very wrapped up in all that. I do And too, then, yeah, yeah, my girlfriend will be like, literally no one cares apart from you. I don't even, I'm not, I don't even notice. Yeah. And I know you the best. So. <laughs> That's so funny, man. Do you know um, uh, Jenton John's? 
Oh, I know their music very well. I don't really, I've never met them. Well, so it's a funny thing. We were just talking about the duos splitting up and, you know, how they name themselves. And so they were a duo for a long time and then, uh, and they're good friends of mine. And then one of the guys, Billy, uh, left the group and he just kind of moved on with his life, wanted to do other stuff. And so now it's just the one guy, Long, but, you know, they kept the name, Jet and Johns. And shout out to Long, man, because I think <laughs> they deal with that shit just so much now it's like where's the other guy like, so did he no, die it's, like it's just one <laughs> yeah. guy but two names it's so confusing <laughs> yeah but then you know if you take the other you know if you half the name then people are going to think it's compl- something it, yeah, completely different yeah then you have to start yeah. over right it's yeah. a new project yeah it's bizarre <laughs> do you guys do all the the design yourself you said the visual part of it is kind of more of your side um we don't we don't actually do it but I mean, I'd say creative, the creative, directed. the creative, yeah, uh, the creative direction is all all from us. Um, we're literally just we're kind of rebranding, not rebranding. We're going for a slightly visual overhaul. Oh, okay. We kind of kind of d- d- had a very similar thing uh, with but, the like triangle uh, imagery. Yeah, the, it's gonna. It's, I know it's not the, called a triangle, but the I, triangles are gonna are gonna be mm, in there. Okay, um, but we're just gonna do it a little bit more subtly. Mm. Uh, it's gonna, you know. It's going to feel like an evolution, really. But yeah. we're currently working on our second album. Nice. So I think it's, it was time for a little visual refresh. Yeah, yeah. And just evolve it a bit. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I think I was looking at your back catalog when I knew I was going to be talking to you. And you know, just even from the artwork on down, I think you guys have done a good job of kind of having a pretty cohesive look to everything, which is one of those things that I, I don't know if the average person thinks about, but I think overall that kind of attention to detail and making sure that everything sort of fits with each other visually, narratively, that goes so far into kind of helping people keep connecting with your music, keep coming back. I don't know. I mean, how much of of that was a thought early on? Early on, it wasn't so much as it is now. Early on, we just wanted to have, I guess, cool looking logo, cool looking artwork, and and then the music videos, which are kind of it's a separate thing, but was always an, a, a very conscious thing. We wanted to, you know, that was an area where we thought we could set ourselves apart from, you know, standard bass, drum and bass, dance music producers. Yeah, um, but. The, that whole side of it, for me personally, I think it's Simon. Is he's less kind of focused on that? He's more just the music, and then that's it. Right. Um, but I get, I've, I get really into it, even to the point like, I mean, I was thinking, eighteen months ago, I, you know, when our Instagram was just flies and, you know, phone <laughs> pics. Now it's like, hundred percent, you know, guys like Jake and right. all these talented people I work with. But it's now getting to the point. I look at my Instagram feed. I'm like. There's, it's not cohesive enough. There's too many different colors. It needs to have a more of an aesthetic. So now I'm thinking, you know, I'm currently trying to devise what's our Instagram page aesthetic's going to be that matches the artwork, right. that matches the tour posters, you know, in ter- even in terms of like how much grain is in a, a photo. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, like the temperature tints and stuff. Man. So I assume I've it, taught myself Lightroom in the past six months just so I can understand. Oh, that's cool more. though. I mean, I, I like it when artists will kind of delve into those other areas to really take care of it, you know? Is it, I get the sense that you must enjoy thinking about that kind of stuff. I do. I think I spend too much time thinking about that kind of stuff. <laughs> I think, I, I, you know, I keep myself up at night basically. But I, I, I don't know, I've, growing up, I've always, I've always been very creative in either writing or actual art. I did art as my A-level, which is the exams you take just before you go to university in the right. UK. So I've always been doing something creative. And What kind of art were you doing? Like visual art? No, it was actual kind of traditional art. I also I studied history of art at university. Oh, okay. I've got a bachelor's in that. Um, it was just, yeah, like painting and drawing. Hmm. And some kind of, you know, we had like modules that were like sculpture and stuff. And it was more like, you know, pencil drawing, painting. So yeah, I did that at school. Was that something at the time that you thought you might want to pursue further? No, never. I was just quite good at drawing, I guess, <laughs> yeah, as yeah. a kid. And then to be honest, like, you know, I did English. I like writing and I was good at English. English art and history of art, quite a lot less 
it's <laughs> not less intensive than maths, engineering. Yeah, you yeah. know, it a could language. be a little. If you want it to be less intense, it can be less intense. They, they were the things I was good at, which was lucky because I was also quite lazy. So <laughs> <laughs> they were like, you know, I could just get away with not turning up to an odd, the odd, odd lot. Oh, it's stuff. a weird thing with artists in sorry, general. Mom. I find, yeah, sorry, mom. It's a weird thing in general, though, with artists. I think, and I think you see this from DJs to musicians to writers on down. It's like. We all have this weird, lazy part, and I, maybe this is just everybody, but I, it, I think to be successful at something like what we're doing, you have to be driven to a certain point. You have to work really hard. It's hard to do what we do, but then we're all lazy, and I've never totally understood how to find that balance. I don't, it's a weird thing, and then I'll, I'll look yeah, at Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. And, I feel like sometimes I'm like, Ben, you're an essentially quite a lazy person, but then... At the same time, I've, I, you know, I ha- happily say I've never worked harder in my whole life than this past two years. Like I've worked, I work harder on this path and this career. I work harder now than I did three or four years ago. Yeah. And then at that point, I worked harder than I did when I was a student. Maybe at it's school. just a maybe it's just a matter of like making sure that whatever you're working on at the time is what you really enjoy. You know, because I, I was just thinking while you were talking. For me, you know, I, I love everything about DJing and making music, but you know, sometimes you'll be working on a song and you'll feel like you kind of hit a wall and you're creatively blocked or something. And then it starts to get less fun for a minute. And then for me, if I can sort of switch gears and go work on some other aspect, like, or maybe for you, if you, you know, can switch over and work on the visual aesthetic of something, maybe that's the key is just kind of always keeping it fresh and not forcing yourself to do what you feel you have to do just to keep the machine going. Yeah, I you know, there's definitely the the more grinding grind parts of uh, music production. Yeah. I mean, to me that's the DJing is the the kind of cherry on top, that's the fun bit. Yeah, no, that's uh, the, my favorite know, thing. The, the 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 engineering and especially when you make, you know, music where the production value is very paramount, which is kind of what we do. Yeah. It's a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of time, you know, EQing snares and <laughs> just mix sounds. That's that's like, you know, I kind of enjoy it. It's quite cathartic, but at the same time, it's quite, you know, it's a long, a lot of, you know, a lot of time. Do you, are you more responsible for the mix downs? Do you guys divide the labor that way? Yeah, I mean, naturally, that's kind of how Simon, I came, I, I mean, I came to this from DJing. I DJed. Basically, since I was about 15 years old at, really? at school, I went to boarding school and had a set of techniques there. Um, and then at university, I started playing out in the in the clubs in Nottingham. Simon played in bands, so he's more he's more of the kind of natural musician. He can play a few instruments, so he can, he's he's more from that side. And I think naturally, I think the type of person, personality I am, and just the fact I was coming at it from a as a DJ rather than a musician, should we say. Um, I think we kind of found our roles naturally. And now as a duo, um, it, we really work well together. I think if we took the other one away, it wouldn't, we'd, you know, he would make some good sounding intros right. and that'd be it. And I'd make some very well engineered eight bar drop loops <laughs> that, and I'm like, I don't know what to do now. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Well, that's good. I mean, I think that's the ideal pairing, right? Is you can kind of complement yeah, each so, other's so, skills. Yeah, certainly have our roles. And, you know, I think now doing this, I think, you know, five, six, seven years, um, from, you know, about seven years when we first started making music, we, you know, when it first started out, I couldn't really tell. Like, I couldn't tell when stuff was out of tune and he literally had no idea. So, you know, and now, you know, Right. I, I can lay down chords. He can put some you know, com, com, a compressor on a sound. You know, I'll go and change the settings. But sure. he, he, he know, you know, he can do some bait. You know, yeah. So I can, mean, you guys kept learning. Which yeah, I think we both is another learned key. each side. Um, but I guess that there, you know, if we had to assign roles, you know, right, right, that, yeah, there'd be that. Sure. I, and again, I mean, it's what's more fun to somebody. What are you better at doing faster? You know, all of that kind of thing. I'm a little curious. You you said you were in boarding school at 15. Where where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in and around London. Okay. Um, it's kind of 
in London and then slightly outside in Surrey, like you know, nice suburbs. I I, I went to quite a well known, famous boarding school. What, what's the name? Would I know it? Eton. Oh, I do know. Yeah, yeah I know the it's, name. It's where like the princes went and stuff. It's pretty famous and very Shit. traditional. Man, um, what was so? From what age did you go there? That that was thirteen to eighteen. Wow. Yeah. Man, it's quite you know. It was an experience. <laughs> the, the, the the kind of stereotypical, the cliches about it are kind of they are kind of true. It's a, quite a strange place. Well, what, when you say cliches, what do you mean exactly? Just there's a lot of quite rich people. Yeah. I you know I had very different. I had a very different background from a lot of the guys there. There's a quite a lot of kind of aristocracy and very rich people. Sure. And I'm not. My parents are not like that at all. So. What did your folks do? Uh, my dad worked in finance. I was like a commercial mortgage broker. My mum just, you know, bought up me and my sister. Yeah. So, you know, we, I think my dad started doing quite well in his job and they just wanted, you know, a good education rather than, there was a lot of kids at Eton who, his, their parents had gone there, their granddad had gone there. Right. And they, they, you know, I went there and didn't know anyone. And I was always slightly a bit of an outsider. Mm. And there was some kind of bullying and stuff. I probably wouldn't send my child there, but... Was it kind it, of like a, you know, like a ritualized, like hazing kind of thing? If like class warfare, almost, you know what I mean? A little bit. I actually remember it, one thing that gives me quite a lot of satisfaction now. Um, people made fun of me for DJing. Really? So I had a set of TEDx in my room. I was about to say you must have been the most popular kid. That's wild. absolutely not. People made fun of me because <laughs> they were just like, "Oh, oh, Ben, all with your decks, like scratching on your decks," and I was just like, you know, <laughs> you think it's well. He's laughing now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, if they didn't want DJs, how were they partying? What were what were they doing for fun? Just God knows. insulting um, people. Anyway, yeah, it, I had a great education. I mean, the facilities there and the teaching is incredible. So I'm very grateful for my parents for sending me there. Yeah. Um, it's just a very traditional English boarding school, so it's got all its quirks. So it feels a bit like it's very insular, and I think a lot of people there don't really have quite. A grasp on the outside world. So yeah. I went to university and mixing with people from all sorts of backgrounds and stuff. I don't think that's where you kind of grow up and start, you know. Yeah, a hundred percent, man. For me, it was music because I had. I mean, I didn't go to boarding school, but uh, sort of a similar background in that you know, middle class family. My parents did fine. We weren't rich. We weren't poor. And but they did send me to a very nice private school, like an expensive yeah. school, and. Even though we were just kind of right in the middle, middle class, going there, you know, there were mostly richer families, and it was yeah, it was kind of bizarre, and it definitely it was very white, gave me a very skewed perspective. Yeah, that I mean, that's very similar, very very similar. It gives you a you know, it kind of they kind of teach people kind of go out of that school or the similar school thinking they're a bit above everyone. Yeah, and then as soon as you get into you know university with everyone else, you are like. Yeah, you know, that's not really the way to be. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny, too, to hear you say that DJing kind of made you the odd one out because it was sort of similar for me. I mean, I was kind of the only, like, raver kid, and that was definitely a very weird thing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it is funny how it turns out. Well, I, I, ironically, now, I bet loads of Eton boys are, you know, going to Fabric every weekend, and I bet they're all into, like... You know, I bet they're all at like Love Box, listening to Jamie Jones and Seth Trox, so and I bet they're at DC Ten and Ibiza on loads of drugs. Yeah, 100%. And all summer and like Blue Mile in the stuff. So I think things will be a bit different. You know, yeah, it's a, I mean the whole off. climate is different now. Although when you were a kid, I would assume dance music in the UK has always been sort of more mainstream or more popular than it has been in the US. I think up until recently. Was it uh, was dance music sort of part of your childhood at all? I wouldn't say childhood, but as soon as I was a teenager, yeah, it's when I guess like you know super clubs first started being built, like Fabric. There was a club called Home in Leicester Square in London, seven floors that lasted about maybe a year, and then Fabric was built at the same time, mm. and then there was the end as well. Um, How old is Fabric? Fabric is wow. I think it may be 20 years. Now. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I've been going for definitely not 20 years, but yeah, I've probably, yeah, I've been going for I, over 15 years. I went, I got into fabric when I was 15. So, I've, yeah, I've been going for, yeah, slightly over 15 years. Wow. Um, Man, I wish I had gone to fabric when I was 15. Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> I used to, and it's cool, my mom knows this now. 
so she doesn't really like it. But I used to sneak out of boarding school in my last few years to go to Fabric and uh, and the end. And I'd go, that's why I saw, you know, that's kind of when I got into drum and bass because as a teenager, I, I got into like kind of commercial like dance music like uh, through Radio 1. Okay, yeah. Uh, just kind of cheesy stuff. And is that what you were DJing at 15 I, years old? I got, my first vinyls was some kind of uh, kind of cheesier, dancey things. Mm. I remember like a couple of Positiva records. Um, oh yeah, they had some good shit back Yeah, in the day. and then I remember like I had Energy, Café Del Mar, Energy 52 on vinyl. And some, some like classic tracks. Yeah, and yeah. And then I got into more, that's when New School Breaks was quite popular, like Adam Freeland. Right. And I got really, he had a show on Kiss 100, this kind of the competitor of Radio 1 in London. And I used to record his show every Friday night on mini discs. Nice. Uh, and he used to play like, you know, New School Breaks and more kind of progressive house. And then I got into Sasha and John Digweed and those kind of DJs. That's actually where we got the name Delta Heavy. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I almost never ask people about where their name comes from because I think that's such a shitty question. But for you guys, I read that it came from them, which I found kind of fascinating. It, it did. I They did this tour in the year 2000, I think, uh, called the Delta Heavy Tour. And some years later, I kind of saw it and I was like, that sounds really cool. And then when we were looking for a name, I was like, what do you think of this? To Simon, and he was like, "That sounds cool." And we'd gone through the kind of the run of terrible yeah. names. I'm not going to mention. <laughs> I remember a few of them, and we sometimes we kind of we have a laugh about it. Um, some really bad. Names. <sighs> I had a few. Yeah, I, off, even man. you know, even then, like it was, this is good. Look, probably like over eight years ago when we were choosing names, <sighs> everything's everything cool's been taken, and then your mind just freezes, and you just come up with some terrible stuff. Right. Um, so yeah, so we came up with that, and then. We found out that, obviously, when we kind of you know got fairly established, Sasha had found out about it, and he was like, "Yeah, it's cool, uh, cool with it." And I think at one point we were on the same; we had the same agent, or our agent's boss was his agent, so right. he found out about it. Um, so apparently, he's cool with it. And then when we did our BBC Radio One Essential mix, which is one of the kind of you know dream. Thick boxes I've ticked now. That's something, an incredible achievement. Something that I was listening to when I was a te- when I was 15 years old, dreaming one maybe one day, and so uh, just hearing Pete Tong, I've got it recorded. I listen to it from time to time <laughs> and just feel the goosebumps. Yeah, of course. But he actually referenced it and how he intro. He said um, he was like in his you know amazing distinctive Pete Tong voice. He said De- uh, Delta Heavy um, took their name from a Sasha tour. From the year two thousand, and then they've come full circle, and then then intro the mix, and it was literally oh, like man. mind blown. That is insane. So it's quite an, it's quite a cool story, and I've never actually met Sasha. I've seen him like uh, afar at a festival, and someone's been, oh, go and go and say hi. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a really cool story. So yeah, that's really cool, man. And I mean, doing an essential mix, that's not everybody gets to do that. Even in this day and age, that's still I think a pretty high trophy to have. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I'd like to think even people outside of the UK still realize how. I'm, but I mean, that really was that was like the benchmark. That was like you've made it. I, I remember um, in college, every time a new essential mix would drop, you know, me and all of my nerdy DJ friends, you know, you'd all rush to listen to it. It yeah. was it was really the one and only sort of high water mark. Yeah, for, I mean, you know, and and. Those kind of times, there was no mix cloud. There was no, mix, you know, you couldn't just go on SoundCloud and search. So it would just be literally recordings of essential mixes, and that would be the only kind of live mixes or anything, you know, online you could find. And you would trust the curation of it too. You know, it's like even if I didn't know the artist who was doing the mix, I would assume if it was the essential mix that this must be somebody important, somebody I should be listening to. Yeah, and you know, people have uh, down the years, people have put in so much effort and. Just I remember Nero's first one. They just went, you know, they went in and just like just stuff, you know, old, you know, sixty stuff, just influences, eighties tunes, soundtrack stuff, you know, Vangelis, and you know, just the way they the way they put it together was just so inspiring. And yeah, it, you know, was it intimidating to put yours together? It really was. It really was because it's like you know, because you always want it to be this kind of. You know, thing this you know part of your legacy, and so it's like, should I put in this hot dance for you know dub plate from now? It's like, oh no, I want to put in some more classic stuff, and how much more, how much kind of you know random stuff do we put in? Like we play a lot of different genres, but it's how much like you know 
non dance floor stuff do you put in? Right. Are people just going to want to hear a mix of bangers or how far do you go? So, what did you do? Uh, a kind of a bit of everything, I think. It was just a, I'd say, a solid, I'd say maybe seven, 75% was like a, a you know, multi genre kind of yeah. delta heavy kind of yeah. set. And then we just put in all the touches like, we're really, one of our biggest influences is Hans Zimmer. Mm. And it was Interstellar had been out a year. It's one of our favorite films. And it's both, it's both of our probably top three film soundtracks. Incredible soundtrack. So there's like three tracks from the soundtrack in there. And then it took a long time, but we managed to kind of, you know, find track, like chain, just we kind of split up some of our tracks. Yeah. And, you know, like interspersed. Interspersed. Yeah. It is something, you know, mountains from the soundtrack. Damn. And then mixing Hans Zimmer, man, that's got a next level. And then so, and then we actually taken parts of our central mix, and that's now in our Paradise Lost, the the production show, because it's a two hour set. We have a about in an hour mark, we have this part of the Interstellar soundtrack where it just all it's uh, the mountain scene when they're uh, the on the planet with the big waves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's got that kind of plop, plop, the kind of plink, plink. So it's so suspenseful. And then all the lights drop down, and we just have this one light that obviously the VJ is sinking to the ding, ding, right. and then it all builds up again, and it's going, and it goes section that goes from drum and bass to the kind of one to eight stuff. Yeah, um, I love so, that. And it's, it just kind of gives the crowd a breather, which I don't think in a lot of bass DJ sets there's enough dynamics in the set and a breathing space. So in a two hour set, it's it's nice. We actually just sit down behind the decks and just kind of. Yeah, no, I love sure. that, man. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there's sort of two things in there I want to touch on. One of which is that, yeah, it's getting worse and worse for bass music sets and kind of it's just all maximum volume, all 110% yeah. the whole time. And, and I don't know, I was trying to think about this earlier today, actually. I don't really know what the end point for that is because it to me it seems like it's already kind of as maximal as it can really get. I don't know how. I don't know how, where it's going to go. Is it? I, it's going to get to the point where the entire set is build ups. Right. And I mean, honestly, sets now are build ups, sixteen bars, and another build up, sixteen bars. So what it's going to be like? Eight bars, four <laughs> bars. I mean, someone put made this thing. It's kind of jokey thing of every single big trap dubstep hybrid kind of build up, literally just spliced together right. and it never drops <laughs> and it went <laughs> oh, and it went that. kind of viral on Twitter yeah, it was, was really amazing. funny that was amazing uh, and then a lot of people were like that's actually what it sounds like and but it's, it's weird as a DJ I think to like play that kind of set I mean I, I've been as guilty of it as anybody else at times but it just I don't know it's less fun for me to I don't really feel like I'm taking people on a journey as pretentious as that sounds well no yeah exactly um I do. It's, it's difficult. I mean, I'm just thinking. I was doing my set for tonight on the train, and there's a lot of you know quick eight bars, sixteen to another tune. Uh, I, I mean, so you, you kind of feel if if this is the norm and this is what the crowd expect. If you're doing something, you're you know if you're playing forty tunes an hour, someone else is playing seventy. <laughs> yeah. you, you feel like your set's going to be a little bit less exciting, less energetic, and the crowd are going to be bored. But at the same point, I mean, it's kind of like I, I see it. It's almost like just crushing the life dynamically out of a track with a limiter and compressors and stuff. If everything is kind of shouting at you, there's no peaks and troughs. There's no kind of sense of a, a journey. I mean, yeah, you know, it's difficult in an hour set, but we, you know, I like to. I know it's a cliche, but we really try to go on a bit of a journey. At least, at least so there's some some kind of peaks and troughs, um, and just letting the odd tune play and just letting. If there's a nice musical atmospheric intro, play it. Don't just jump to the eight bar build up. Yeah, exactly, man. Um, I think I think it's about, you know, sort of the strength of your conviction as a DJ and, and sort of just about setting the audience's expectations. Yeah, totally. Because, you know, if you just come out and you play the set the way you want to do it, and there are those peaks and valleys, people might be confused at first. And as a DJ, I might feel insecure about that, like in front of all these people with a quiet moment. And there's kind of that awkwardness if people are just expecting banger after banger. But I think if you just push through that, 
uh, and I guess I'm just giving myself advice right now. But <laughs> no, I, I, I'm very much the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think once you get through that, those first 10, 20 minutes, it, it actually kind of works out. People sort of just instinctually get on that same wavelength. Yeah, I th- it's as you say, it's about kind of having some con- having some conviction and trusting what you want to do, and you know, realizing not just because not everyone is headbanging for an entire hour. That's okay. It's okay. That's fine. Yeah. If they're just kind of standing there vibing for a bit, that's totally cool. And I was, I think we've, we've been chatting about it recently. There's a lot of, uh, there's, look at someone like uh, Rez, who is now like, I mean, she, I think she's closing Lost Lands this weekend. Yeah. Uh, I played it last year. I'm not involved this year, but um, it's like, you know, Jeff's the EDC of dubstep. It's a, yeah, it's a no, fantastic festival. What social doing. media has been going crazy. Yeah. Before, um, yeah. Bit sad, I'm not that. <laughs> <laughs> a little FOMO. We, I've chatted to Jeff out, it's all good. <laughs> the next year. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think Rez is playing the main stage, you know, after all these like, you know, banger, like banger fest, all these guys with all these killer, you know, huge dubstep tunes. Uh, and her stuff's around 100 BPM. There's no one really headbang. You can't really headbang to it. Yeah. You can't really go crazy to it just because of the, the, but who there isn't having the time of their lives, who isn't kind of tripping out, getting kind of lost in the music, her whole thing. Yeah, yeah, and, she's been so good about making her And she whole, just does she just does her thing. Yeah, yeah. No but, concessions to whatever else. It's just her. And yeah, you look at the crowd, everyone's got, not going mental, they're not like moshing, thrashing, headbanging constantly. But look at, you know, look how far she's come. Look at, she's closing all these stages. Um, I think that, that's just, it just demonstrates that you don't have to just, play the game just 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 to get you know people dancing right exactly i think some of it at least for me the more i talk about this with people and the more i think about it for myself it comes back to my own insecurities in a way of just you know really feeling awkward if i don't see everybody going well, crazy all the time exactly but that's sort of then i think about for myself like when I've seen shows that really affected me or that I really liked, I wasn't always going crazy. You know, sometimes I was just kind of sitting and taking it all in. And, you know, I don't know. People experience it all different ways. I don't even know how I feel about the whole headbanging thing, to be honest. Because I can't, like, that didn't exist when I was a little raver kid. Like, yeah, me too. I just went to uh, dance the whole me time. Too. I've got some quite strong views about it that I keep taking off basically <laughs> typing out tweets and deleting them yeah I need to be careful here but, yeah um, I, all I'm going to say is I do feel in well certainly north of well just the USA the kind of the whole dance part of electronic dance music people kind of forgetting dancing the dance there's part. no dancing yeah and it's why I, I, I you know struggle to play a huge amount of drum and bass in my sets whereas ter- you know in Europe I could, you know, we we do the kind of mixture on the thing most almost every country we play, and we play everywhere, uh, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but there's a lot of places in North America. I, you know, if I played a whole hour of drum bass, I would literally they'd just stand there looking at me. And some people maybe don't like it, don't get it. A lot of people like it, but they just. They're not head, they, you yeah. can't really headbang to it. I mean, do you think this, this is a thing I always every five years or so somebody will say like, "Oh, this is this is the time when drum and bass is really gonna finally hit the states. It's yeah. finally gonna cross over." My opinion, I'll, I'll just say that my opinion is that it's never fully gonna cross. No, over. I, I'm 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 fully I'm fully with you there. <laughs> uh, you know, see, people say it, and I'm like, yeah, you're not the one touring out here all the time and seeing it every single week. Yeah. People like it. Um, all the producers like it. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's, um, technically, it's some of the hardest, most complicated music to make. So there's I a I mean, level... I think it's the most, in terms of just pure, you know, technical, fiddly and, you know, yeah. wizardry, I think just because of the, the BPM, there's just less space. Yeah. Um, and and you know I think that's where the real sound design wizards gravitate towards. It's just you know there's I have an appreciation for at a technical level how hard it is to make, but yeah I think it's so strongly rooted in the UK that if you don't, I, I feel like growing up in the UK maybe you kind of have this instinctual understanding of what it is and where it fits in. And I, th- I think that's a very large part of it. Yeah, yeah. Because I think about even when I was in college, like. 
drum and bass acts have always come over here and always toured, and I would go out to see them. But it was really only, you know, the biggest of the big names that would draw a crowd, even back then, you know? Yeah, I think it's it's um, still kind of the case. I, you know, for us, we're in quite a unique position because we're one of the only uh, drum and bass acts who does other stuff. Yeah, I mean, and do you even consider yourself a drum and bass act? No, I don't. But, I mean, we get pigeonholed as one, yeah. which I... You know, uh, I think any act who makes lots of different genres hates it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know a producer who's like, oh, I'm a dubstep producer. Of course. I'm a, you know, people just, they want to make music. I think it's everyone else who likes, loves putting people in boxes, talent buyers, you know, people putting festival stages up, you yeah. know. Yeah, it's easier. Programming to, events, you know, labels, it's easier to just label someone. Word again, you know. right? Yeah. Um, but no, we de- certainly don't consider ourselves a drum bass act at all. I think if you look at our, if you actually look at our back catalog, it's probably sixty percent drum bass tempo stuff. Even though it may, some of it doesn't even sound like DMB, and other, the, the rest is other stuff. Um, so yeah, sometimes I think that's one of my main. If I had to air a frustration, it's being pigeonholed as a UK drum bass act. It's like, well, we play a lot of other stuff. We make a lot of other stuff, and you always have, and we always have, and that I think we wouldn't have actually, we wouldn't have the career, the touring career we, we have in this country without making the other stuff. Uh, it was only when we made, we had this Nero remix, which was a 110 BPM yeah. thing. And, a, and then a few of the dubstep tracks that really kind of connected in 2012 when, you know, that it was the kind of first big American dubstep takeoff. I don't think we would have had the touring history we've, we've had and, you know, been lucky enough to experience without those tracks. If we just made drum bass, I think we'd just be playing in Europe. Sure. Probably doing okay, but... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And do you tour that big production show all over Europe, or is that more of a UK? It's well, we've done we've thing. done three. Did our first one in London last November. Then we took it to Amsterdam in January and Perth in Australia. Oh, nice. Um, in February, it's. I mean, there. If I had to pick five, you know, three of our top ten tickets, we set, you know cities who sell the most tickets, and you know, really feel like we've got yeah. a real strong fan base there. But I mean. Like all production shows, there's plenty of places we could take it. It's just the logistics. Of course. I mean, we're talking about, obviously, LA. Uh, the next one, uh, LA, Vancouver, Toronto, and then, you know, other Paris and Paris, Vienna. But it's a production show. So, you know, if we break even, we've done an amazing job. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think people understand how much money goes into these touring no. productions. So, I mean, you know, it's it's a huge amount of pressure. I've, yeah, I mean. And of course, you don't want to put it up in a place where you might not make the money back, you know, because it's so much well, money it, we're talking about. Exactly. And it's not, just, it's not just the cost of the production, it's the fact that we both have to be there, our manager has to be there, our VJ has to be there. Um, you know, yeah, that's flights, More hotels, flights, but then, yeah, you know, this is this is an area of the industry I've only actually got involved in in the past year. I think once you get to a certain level, it's like, wow, we're at this level, amazing. But also, it's so much more stressful. <laughs> and now I'm worrying. You know, I I never when we first started out, I was like, cool, making music, DJing, traveling, drinking, fun. Right. Now I'm like, ticket sales, ticket sales, <laughs> <laughs> ticket sales, flights, like yeah. Yeah, breaking even, tickets. It's like you know. <laughs> So all this stuff. I mean, it's good stresses. But no, yeah. I mean, it these, is, are, these are the good kind of problems to have. But it is true, man, that I, none of us really thought about... There's always that mentality of like, oh, if I can just get to this level, I'll be set. Everything will be perfect. You That's know? what everyone thinks. And, you know, it's, the kind of, it's kind of like a never-ending book, really. You can always go deeper with um, it. I mean, I, I was talking uh, to a friend earlier today about, you know, some of the biggest DJs in the world and their lives. And they're like, man, you know, it must be so crazy just to travel everywhere, to live like a rock star, all that. And I mean, sure, that's true. But at the same time, like, I know some of these guys, like, I don't know if I want that life, you know? Yeah, there's, there's I mean, yeah, so oh, I wish that, you know, Calvin Harris must have such a great life. And it's, <laughs> it's like, you know, most of these guys don't even, they're, you know, they don't really have they're a life like at all. They're sober because they're so busy. And they're right. Just, yeah. Yeah. They're, you know, their kind of schedule is so demanding, even compared to, you know, ours, that, you know, there's no time for, you know, oh, yeah, it's like rock star life. 
they have the least rock solid. That's that's exactly right. Yeah, they don't have time to be around. Funny enough, so. the, the the people I see who kind of party the most are like the the opening DJs and the people yeah. who are in their first year of like, oh wow, I'm touring. It's like the, the longer you do this, the kind of more professional you become and the more kind of disciplined you have to be. Absolutely, man. I mean, it's so competitive. And like we said at the start of this, I mean, it's a lot of hard work, you know, and I don't think a, I don't think any of us really give ourselves a lot of breaks, a lot of time off. And, you know, so in those little spaces that you do carve out for yourself, if all you're doing is kind of just, you know, drinking or partying or whatever, you, you won't be able to get back into the work. It, yeah, it's, exactly. It's sort of a vicious cycle. I don't know, man. I <laughs> it's weird. I've been thinking a lot about like what we put ourselves through for this. Um, you know, there's like the uh, Hardwell, like kind of taking a step back. Yeah, recently. yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah, and, I mean, I, I think there's, there's, you know, with some of the things that have been happening to people um yeah I there's mean, a Mac lot Miller, you know there's a lot of dialogue out there at the moment which i think is great and i think yeah uh, no i mean i'm glad it's getting out in the open um, yeah the but, more dialogue i think that's around the better really, yeah without you know getting too deep into that no subject. no no and i think it's just good to raise awareness in general that this is kind of something we all go through and i think as artists it's important for us to be told that too because i've certainly been guilty of just thinking that sort of I'm the only one who feels like anxious and overwhelmed and then everybody else, you just look, you know, if you're scrolling Instagram, everybody's well, having a great time exactly. at the party. And you, know? You, know, I, you know, even speaking personal experience, you know, there's times I think, you know, a while ago, I would feel, or you'd, you almost feel kind of, you shouldn't feel these kind of feelings and thoughts, feel right. guilty about it. It's just like, hey, I'm a DJ, like, you know, your friends are in an office job, like, they kill to do what you, you do. You know, you work for yourself. If you don't want to get up, if you want to stay in bed on Monday, you can, you can <laughs> probably get away with it right. and things will be fine. And, you know, you get to fly around doing what you love for a living and, you know, getting paid drinks, getting given drinks, all this stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's like, you know, there's, I think there's a lot of guilt involved in actually feeling like, you know what? This kind of sucks today. I feel lonely. I'm tired. Right. You know, I've got kind of anxiety because I haven't had much sleep. You know, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. You know, I haven't. You know, spoke to my friends for two weeks. I'm sick of this hotel room. Sick of you know all yeah. this stuff. But you know, I think there is a little bit of a stigma. Like you should be grateful for being having this amazing cool life. Absolutely. But it doesn't really work like that. As it, it I think a lot work, of people know. Yeah, now. no, 100% it doesn't work like that. And there's that expectation that you're the party guy all the time, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, which I also have trouble playing into most of the time. Yeah, I, I'm I'm quite happy <laughs> to often fit that role. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, a lot of my DJ contemporaries are some of the most like most non-party people, kind of boring people. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to all, all my them. friends from home are like they're they're like yo, you're here. It's it, that's fun. <laughs> you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about you know before the the touring the world and the the albums and all that. You know, so if from boarding school, you know, you go through that till age 18, you go on to university, uh, doing art history. And is university where you met Simon? Yes, we were both studying at Nottingham. Um, okay. And we met. How far is that from London? It's about, I think it's about nothing in terms of US distances. It's kind of in the Midlands. It's about, uh, I think it's around 130 miles. So yeah, a couple hours. Two hour, two hour drive. Yeah. Uh, it's a nice town. It yeah. is the furthest city or town from the coasts. So so that's nice. Oh, okay. It's a nice bit of trivia. It's yeah. where Robin Hood is from. Oh, yeah, of course. Of sure, uh, yeah, it's a nice town. So yeah, Simon's girlfriend, who's now his wife, she was friends with a guy I knew from my kind of student accommodation. So we, we, we weren't really good friends at uni. We we're kind of mutual friends in a big group. We both kind of DJed at house parties and stuff. I and we both started playing at the local nights. He actually started off playing. We both like drum and bass. He started playing dubstep. Actually, that mm. was was that kind of like the birth of dubstep around that. We time? were really into D and B. Obviously, that you know D and B always always been strong in the UK. So we we would go to Ram Records nights. So which now obviously we're still signed to. Uh, and you see, and then this label called Renegade, Renegade Hardware, which is kind of a darker sound. Legendary. So we used to go. We used to go to the end and Fabric, and you know we'd be buying vinyls all the time. So all our friends, all the kind of guys, were all into it. 
we were also Simon was really into it, but I we were both into the this early dubstep sound, the kind of the scream banger, you know, um, DMs in Digital Mystics, yeah, Koki, Koki and Marla and I mean, Lofa. A, we we loved that. That was a revolution at the time, man. Yeah, it was. So we, yeah, so when we moved to London a year after uni, uh, we used to go to Plastic People religious every every Friday. Um, and for the people who don't know, talk a little bit about Plastic People. Plastic People is where a night called Forward, FWD, which was the kind of pirate, I think it was, I think it was Hatcher's, Hatcher's Night, Hatcher and Youngster, they're the residents. So Plastic, Plastic People was a very small, I think about 350 capacity club in Shoreditch, uh, E1 in London. And that's where there was Forward, a Plastic People, a small night every Friday. And then they'd have DMZ at uh, Mass, which was a, an old church in mid center of Brixton, which isn't a club anymore. Um, so that was a bigger night that they'd have monthly. And, and, and those, Brick, I mean, that was quite a scary place to go for, <laughs> for kind of middle class teenagers. Um, right. But plastic people, it was, yeah, it was just youngster and, you and, know, and I mean, those nights are like, that's where the legendary dubstep night started, right? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, so, obviously they they didn't start in London itself, but I'm saying once it sort of became a movement. That I mean, it, it came started in Croydon, and that's where that sound was really birthed. Uh, and so we'd we'd do that, and we'd go to these you know Ram Records at Ram Records at the end, and Ram Records at Matter when that was a thing. In our early twenties, we were going out all the time. You know, we'd all just moved to London. We were all moved out of our parents' place, so all living in kind of uh, flats, apartments all around London. Uh, and it was our group of uni friends. So we were going out all the time. Um, and I think, so I think that those two sounds, that was what we were super into and just going out all the time and getting inspired and just wanting to, wanting to DJ and be where they were. And also just, you know, five to, five to six hours every Friday of, of either that early dubstep or that kind of, you know, mid late 2000s D and B that's really what I think for, forged our sound. And that was just, you know, when we'd go to our kind of day jobs, I, I just worked at my, my dad's office. He gave me a job sure. just to kind of pay the bills. Yeah, that's nice. And Simon had various jobs. He worked at a, like a runner and recording studios, then worked at like a management company. So it was, we were all, you know, at that point in your early twenties, you're, you're living for the weekend. That's, I was literally um, about to say living for the weekend. Living for the weekend. <laughs> and, it was just, you know, so that would kind of get us through thinking like, this is where we want to be. This is the music we want to be, you know, just involved in this music, DJing this music, making this music. You guys were both DJing on the side kind of. Yeah, not really when we moved back to London. Okay. That was the goal. Um, but I think at that point, we kind of, you know, became closer friends. And we had both realized we kind of shared this, uh, you know, ambition to take this kind of DJing hobby and, you know, love of this underground music to you know into more of a career because it was at that point everyone had either left uni or left uni done a year's kind of standard gap year kind of traveling i went to south america with my then girlfriend oh wow uh, which is really yeah that was amazing that sounds great but it was coming back from that and it was like is that just like a like a vacation or were you there for like a purpose just you know it was like a, they call it a gap year right. in the uk it was six it was just we worked for six months saved up loads of money and just went, just traveling, yeah. backpacking really all around uh, Central South America, which is incredible, incredible experience. Um, but coming back from that and then realizing, wow, it's time to get a proper job. This is it now, adult life. It was like the kind of penny dropped and it was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to sit in an office. I was thinking of going to advertising or something, but I just, I had no passion. I didn't care. You know, I had this, you know, Actually, I had an application form for MNC Saatchi, you know, a big ad company, just sitting on my desktop for like months. And I was like, I can't, I can't even bring myself to fill in the first paragraph. <laughs> so I think that was really, you know, 10 Yeah, something. yeah, if you can't even get that done. So I think, you know, when, you know, we're in our early 20s, so maybe a bit older uh, than some guys coming into the music scene now. And I think it was that real like shit, we have to, this is it. We have to like make something happen now. Otherwise we're gonna have to go and get real jobs. Yeah, now or never. So we had this real, and it was like, you know, we have, we're living on our own. We both had girlfriends. It was like time to pay, we have to pay the rent. So we had this quite, you know, strong, you know, desire to kind of 
get out of that situation and you know we set a goal like let's try and make this happen let's yeah. make some tunes together see what happens and let's try and become DJs as our job and so that was kind of the goal and that's how you know Delta Heavy first really started how did it uh, how was it in those early years or you know even that first year of really trying because I think taking that leap can be such especially I was the same way I had an office job and you know, stepping off that ledge in you know office job is like you know there's financial security. You kind of know what the next six months looks like, all that kind of stuff. I think taking the leap and just saying no, we're going to do it, that can be a really scary thing. It was a scary thing for me. How did it go for you guys? Was it tough at first, or did you kind of take to it pretty quickly? I mean, we were still working both. I think part time. Oh, that's good. Up to the point, uh, I said goodbye to my old man which he was very very happy about because I was a terrible <laughs> terrible employee terrible the worst he was it was, I was like the worst office assistant ever employed and I just got away with it because it was my dad it was just nepotism at and its finest it was yeah. absolute nepotism <laughs> and like all the secretaries around just used to look at me they were quite fond of me but at the same time they were like god he gets away with murder and then my dad would be like let's go to lunch Ben and we'd go go for like a two hour lunch my dad would drink loads of red wine it was great <laughs> like nice tapas bar in Mayfair oh there you go um, <laughs> and they'll come back like glaring at me and then I'd literally just like you know I'd have like dogs on acid drum and bass forum and like BBC Sport minimised and I would just I wouldn't even get good at clicking back up to the Excel <laughs> spreadsheet I'd just leave it there and my dad would be like <sighs> yeah. just, just walk past me and just sigh and I'd be like well I don't want to be here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we, we were, so he came to an understanding. He, you know, my parents were great. They really supported me. You know, they kind of helped me out when I was short cast. They've been so supportive. So, you know, they're, they're now super proud. So that's great. Man. Yeah. Uh, that's an ideal but, situation. So we didn't give up our part time jobs till we were signed to RAM and we'd had our first track out that was the track Space Time that Andy C was famously opening sets for for like eight months, like all 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 of like 2011. That must um, have felt good, man. That was amazing. That was like, wow, we made it. We haven't made it, but <laughs> yeah, but you that, still. That, I mean, that was like that was a dream come true. And but we didn't. It was only we kept working part time until we, you know, started getting some offers in for DJ gigs, and then it was like, right, we're done. Let's let's make the leap. But we so we were still, you know, we'd. Yeah. Well, got, you did it you know, the right we, way. We, we got our record contract that we're still on now. So we'd been, you know, we were a year into that before we said goodbye to the job. So I mean, it but I mean, it like... was it was still a big, you know, like whoa, what you know, what are we doing? Right. Um, I, I guess it was just more like, you know, it gave, gave us more drive to make sure this this has got to work. We've got to make sure this work. Yeah. Like no slacking off. Yeah, it's the same you know. way for me, man. I still, honestly, I feel the same way even today like i still feel some of that like i this is something i just have to make it work because i'm committed at this point i mean point, we both know? have that every single day yeah i mean yeah it's like what we're we gonna do now like look at your cv <laughs> <laughs> right exactly yeah, oh, like man. you're in your early 30s like what have you what have you done <laughs> it's like ooh. yeah it doesn't look yeah, so back, good. yeah get back on the computer <laughs> <laughs> and so how did you get signed to ram how did that come about uh, another quite cool story. So my little sister, who is now married to one of Chase and Stasis, um, she, I got her a job. I helped her get a job at Fabric as an artist liaison, and so she worked at Fabric. And then they b built this club, Matter, which was in the Millennium Dome. Mm. It's defunct now because it it was just a terrible location to have a nightclub. The <laughs> Greenwich. Pier and Millennium Dome is so far from central London, it was a nightmare to get to. Oh, yeah. So it was kind of doomed from the start, but the club they built was absolutely incredible. So Ram Records moved their night. They did went from the end shot, sadly, that went to Fabric for a bit, and then they moved to Matter, um, which is uh, where Space Time first got played. But so she was the artist liaison at the Friday nights. So all the kind of, not the house and techno nights, the kind of bass nights, yeah. underground music, that, that kind of, not all I know about. Um, so she was the artist liaison and so she she met Andy C and Scott from Ram and she just gave them a demo CD and at that point we'd had track out on Viper recordings our first like release and she gave them a CD didn't hear, hear anything for like two and a half months and then suddenly she called me up I was at, at, at my dad's office and she was literally she couldn't even talk 
she was just like... <gasps> I think she might be with my mom shopping. Okay. And she, she was like, couldn't even talk. I was like, I can't understand you. She was like half laughing, half crying, just in hysterics. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, they want to come in. <laughs> Scott, Scott, what's you coming for a meeting? They, they want to sign the tracks. And I, I, you know, that was, that was really, <sighs> I still remember the feeling. Yeah, yeah. And this is from someone who, I think I had pictures of Andy C on my wall. Probably not at my boarding school room, right? But at least at home. Well, yeah, and I, then you had to have like you had to kind of had girls in bikinis, <laughs> right? It might have been. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, um, I mean, and for listeners who may not understand, like Andy C, especially at that time, especially in the UK, I mean, that's a superstar. I mean, for right? drum based music, Andy C is he's like the he's like the goat. He's the LeBron. Of, yeah, he is. And in terms of DJing, he is up there. He's like a Richie Horton, He's Carl, Carl Cox. Unbelievable. Um, you know, he is Mr. Drum and Bass. And Ram Records, it's it's the oldest, one of the oldest drum and bass labels. And in terms of the sound, that was what we were obsessed with. I I, I had all the Ram release on vinyl. I used yeah. to, I it was by on site before you even know who it was. And I'm good friend, you know, good friends with a lot of the other artists there. The younger ones like. Subfocus and Culture Shock, and they'd all been signed to Ram, and I'd not got to know them through various mutual friends in London. And so it was really, it honestly, it's a bit of a cliche. It was a dream come true. I yeah. dreamed about dreams about being on Ram, and I never thought it would happen. So when we went in for a meeting, and they were like, "We want to sign Space Time immediately," put it out. What else have you got? No, actually, we had a couple of tracks, and we had Space Time as a little demo, and they were like, "This sounds good. Finish it off. We want to hear more." house friday sound <laughs> and we went in i think i was like dad i'm not coming into work so just suck it um <laughs> like i'm ill and he was like he was like you know go for it son you know go and make it so um so we made space time in three days it's the only only track ever in like seven years we've made in three days now it takes about six months yeah <laughs> um but we made it took it down again saw them uh played them at and that night, Andy C played it in Toronto. And that, I guess, the rest is history. So right. then what? we got signed to Ram. And, and you said you're still with them to this day, right? Yeah, they're now in it's some now, form. Well, it's kind of, they were bought by BMG. So we're signed to BMG. We're actually, this are, is our last, this album's, I think, our last commitment with them. Mm. So it's been quite a journey. But, um, but I mean, that's that's even rare, man, to stick with one label, even if you know they yeah, get I mean, or whatever. It was a contract like, signed. I think sure, things may have been slightly different had we not done that. But because um, I mean, I go back and forth about a long contract, a short contract. What's better for new artists? Um, things, to be honest, things have changed since you know when we first signed to the label. Yeah, quite a few years ago, the the way things are in music. Uh, it's so completely different. The, it's almost the whole you, landscape is. Different. You can't really compare the two. Yeah. So I think being certainly back then, it, you had to be on a record label. It was vital. Yeah. Nowadays, it, it's obviously way less important. You well, can and, get away with not having it. I think there's pros and cons. There's yeah. always pros and cons. To Absolutely. Both sides, so. and, and I mean, I there's that's, this, that's all I'm going to say. That's about that. totally fine. Yeah. I, there's now this model, and I've talked about this on the show before. Of you know, you'll sort of see a new artist get signed to a label. They'll put out, you know, whatever it is, an EP or an album. And then after that, they'll kind of go out on their own and oftentimes even make their own label. Uh, yeah, it seems to be the, the, you know, turn the it into path, their own yeah. own thing. And I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, if you're able to talk about this, one thing I am curious about is sort of the resources that are available to you via BMG. And do you feel like, you know, being part of a, a major label like that, has that afforded you some opportunities that wouldn't have been open to you otherwise? Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, yeah, it certainly does. It's just, I mean, being signed to an established label and, you know, and obviously we've only had a proper manager in the last three years. Really? All the yeah, time well, before my, that? My sister kind of helped us out. Oh, okay. So she's now, she's now an artist manager in her own right. She's, she worked for Annie Mac. Oh, that's uh, awesome. And now she's, she has a, she's just, she's gone out on her own and she has. That's so cool. Well, I mean, she has a small roster of some up and coming house guys, Mele, um, oh, and William, Mele. William Jocko. And uh, Lauren Asung, but now she's working. She's just taken over um, Patrick Topping and eats everything for her friend who's on maternity leave. Oh, that's big! So she's now, you know, bossing it in the house. Scene. <laughs> that's so uh, cool. And her husband is obviously Will from Jason Status. He's, you know, my brother-in-law and like a really close friend of mine. So we're kind of a little family. Of, yeah, what a cool connection, man! Uh, music, music industry. 
I like it when people keep it in the family. No, it's, way, it's, it's great. It's quite, it's quite funny, really, how it's, how it's <laughs> turned out. But yeah, being signed to a big label, you just, you know, when we didn't have a manager, you didn't, we didn't have to worry about, oh, how do we put a track online? How do we get it from a, you know, the... All the little The things. middlemen and the distributors and all that. You don't have to worry about that. You just have to do the track, you know, yep. design the artwork, yep. choose the artwork, and then your job is done. And even now, you know, we have a manager to take care of all the, the middle, middle stuff. Uh, we still don't really have to worry about anything like that and you know if we had our own label we would have to so i guess it takes that all that side out of the equation and lets you just concentrate on music if that's all you want to do um which i think for most artists is a good thing yeah uh and you know if they just you know have big labels have links they have links to radio pluggers they have links to music video commissioners right Designers, graphic designers, and I think that's, publishers, right. vocalists, all that, all that side. So, and I do think that's something that maybe has set you guys apart in your career. Is you know there was a certain point in time where you were really kind of blowing up for these videos you were doing, right, and for um, uh, sort of all different kinds of music, like we were talking about before. I mean, you've had radio records in the UK and and lots of other places, I'm sure. Do you think that's something that, uh, you know, had you not been signed to a bigger label would have been harder to do, especially with the videos? Uh, funny enough, the videos I'd attribute all to us. Really? Obviously, they gave us the budget, which is, you know... We, it's got to come from somewhere. But, yeah. you, know, the bu- you know, budgets are part of an advance, so yeah. we, we do recoup that. Yeah. They recoup that from our sales, so it all, you know, works out as contracts state and stuff. But... Um, <laughs> But yeah, the music videos, we sourced all uh, the we sourced the directors and found them ourselves. So that oh, was something so cool. something I'm quite, we're we're all, we're quite proud and protective over. So I'm quite happy to say that that was something we we did independently. And and are you guys still doing those kind of like crazy high concept videos? Like I I I, I mean, might just be ignorant. I mean, that's the plan. We have we still have a lot of music to finish yeah. before we can start thinking about that. Yeah. That's that, that's the kind of fun part. Once we, you know. Next year, the album is set for February. We have a huge amount to do before then, but that's the kind of fun part. Once you've got the music finished, you can start thinking what's what could be a good single, what's going to suit music video. So yeah, I mean, we haven't done one for about eighteen months. Uh, we actually, we you know, for our single last year, nobody but you, we had one, had a really cool idea, and it didn't quite turn out how you wanted, and we just kind of left it behind. Mm. Excuse and me. yeah, for the listeners, if you haven't uh, watched, I'm going to put a link in the description of this episode. You got to go check out the videos because that's a that's a whole nother level of this. And how did the the album idea come about? Was that always a goal of yours in general, or did you kind of come around to it after doing you know so many singles? Yeah, I, uh, the first album was def- a definite goal, but it we first started thinking about it in like 2013. And obviously, it only came out in 2016. We we had a bunch of tracks together, but we ended up, and we were like, we've got an album, we've got 11, 12 tracks, but we ended up dumping half of it because it, it it wasn't quite right. And there was a few things on there that, in retrospect, was a good idea to leave behind. Um, you know, you go through these periods as a producer, you sometimes get a little bit caught up in the whole thing, and it's difficult sometimes to see it from to have that with perspective, perspective yeah. and you know to look at it from the kind of outside in when you're just so in amongst it and yeah it, the, the collection of tracks probably wasn't a great album and i don't think we actually had enough just dance or just solid dance or stuff on there so we went away it, and you know the people were like we're not sure it's it's going to work and hearing that initially when you've been all you've been doing is studio for months it's <laughs> yeah. kind of hard to take but when you realize yeah they're probably right Go back in with a you know some you know f- you know fresh kind of a fresh attitude and like right let's tackle this let's get it done and then six months later we had the album and it was a lot it worked a lot more as a package mm. and it felt like it ticked all the boxes that we should do for our first album so the first album definitely we you know was intended it didn't just kind of just happen uh, this album. We, I after that one, I was like, never again. <laughs> well, let's just do singles. You don't need to do an album this day and age. Singles are better. But what we found is, single. If you're just doing singles, it's a lot harder to tell a story, especially when you're trying to 
kind of step up touring in places yep. and you know like if you want to start going up the next level of set times at festivals yep. and all that all that kind of stuff yeah, it's a matter of public perception um, right it's a lot easier people buy in a lot more to a larger project it's a lot easier to you know it goes back to the whole kind of everything to do with it artwork branding all that kind of stuff there's it's, it's a lot more interesting to involve that with a larger body of work just singles everyone these days is just pumping out singles so it's another way you can set yourself apart i think so you know early this year it became apparent that's what we wanted just you know take what we've got right now and take it to another next step right uh we wanted it's like time for another body of work yeah. whether it's you know, a large EP or an album, a large EP, you add two tracks, that's an album. So, and you have to keep challenging yourself too. Exactly. Right? And, you know, initially I was a bit like, oh, I don't know, you know, oh, I can't think the idea of another album is, is too much to deal with. <laughs> but, you know, as you start, you know, the work in progress is and, you know, some of the demos and stuff, you can, as soon as you start seeing like a little skeleton of how it could like flesh out, uh, then we kind of came around excited, to the idea. Right? And also, the only way, especially for an act who's kind of known for just big dance floor stuff, the only way you can actually put, produce some, put, I mean, put out, sorry, uh, and release some some more experimental stuff that is just not going to work as a single is an album. And to package it with, you know, yeah. stronger, more commercial singles and dance floor stuff, yeah. that's when it can work as part of a little journey. And we've always wanted to do, you know, the different stuff, the more experimental stuff, and the way we put it out is, is part of a large body of work. That we've completely come around to the idea of album two, and suddenly it's like, yeah, it's you guys. What's going on? <laughs> You're right, of course. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> when you said the the first one, you you had some maybe mixed feelings afterwards. Was that just because of the amount of work putting out an album? Just thing? just the amount of work and the amount of stress. I yeah. think, and I just think because it took so long, and we went through so many ups and downs, just kind of you know personal and career wise, just that whole. It was just so long, and it got so protracted. Like. This one, it's been a lot more concise, and I think now we've got a lot more of an idea of what, how we want it to sound, yeah. who we are right now, and so it's. I think it's been our writing process has been a lot more concise and streamlined. So I don't know. I feel like it should. It, we should have actually felt more stress. And I've, <laughs> yeah, I've yeah. got that to come. I've got the. I'm taking off. Six, I'm taking of six weeks of touring to to mix it down. Oh man, that's where the stress happens. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I feel like it should should be more stressful. Should, should feel more stress. <laughs> but I think it's you know the writing process has been a bit more, as I said, streamlined and just to the point. So we've kind of got to this point. Yeah. Uh, with less, you know, less less kind of like ups and downs. Just more like this is what we want to do. We've got these tracks. We kind of know what a sound here. So. Yeah, just, I, well, I'm excited done. to hear it, man. I, and maybe this is a good way to start bringing this one home is to, you know, it makes me wonder sort of where do you see yourself fitting in at this point in 2018? You know, obviously you are becoming more confident in your sound year after year. I think you've really established that strong aesthetic that we've talked about a few times now. But, you know, for you guys, what what keeps you excited? What keeps you motivated? Kind of where do you see yourself in the greater landscape of dance music at this point? I mean, I guess it's so hard to stand out these days. And I just feel we have aspects that makes us stand out. Um, you know, the stuff you, you've mentioned, I feel like we, you know, our tracks have a sound. I feel, you know. It's very cinematic it, to me. It, it is, it is. Uh, that's something we really aim for. I mean, I guess so, you already mentioned Hans Zimmer. So. I feel like we we have a sound, a kind of signature sound that, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, that sounds like a Delta Heavy track, and that means so much to us. Um, so there's that, and also the fact that you know, there's not many, there's not that many, say, North American bass acts who make a lot of drum bass, play a lot of drum bass. At the same time, there's not a lot, a lot of European drum bass acts who do dubstep or trap or other stuff. We're one of the only people who do that. So we have, you know, a lot of people spend a long time trying to work out what makes them different. We naturally have that and we always have done. So it's just, it's just keep hammering that home and just, because that's, that's what inspires us, doing these different, you know, having all these different kind of fingers in each pie. It's not, we're not trying to just be part of every scene. It, we're just literally doing what, we'd get bored writing one thing. So we're just doing what we enjoy. And that is actually what sets us apart. So 
I mean, to us, that's natural. So I love that's, that, man. That's no, it, really. no, that's beautiful. I mean, that's almost what we were talking about before of how do you how do you stay enjoying it and how do you not get stressed out? Is you know you have to just focus on what you're into at the time, what's fun at the time, and I think that's that kind of authenticity. It's like Res we were talking about earlier. That's what's going to make people connect to your music yeah. rather than you just trying to make whatever's hot at the time. Is uh, there anything else we haven't covered? Anything else you want to get out there? Yeah, one thing, another thing we haven't touched on, uh, and that's something I think being me being in America has kind of facilitated. We've actually, for the first time really in our career, we've really started thinking about Collabor- collaborating with other people, mm. not just vocalists, not just future vocalists, but other people in the scene, other producers. So we thought it's time to start doing that, and that's another aspect that we haven't done before, and that's something that we can maybe. This is what's going to set this second album apart from the first. So yeah, we started kind of hitting people up in the last kind of six months or so, and then almost at the same time, out of nowhere, we're being hit up by people out of the blue. So it's actually somehow we've ended up with a lot of different collabs that some will definitely be on the album, some just naturally won't because they're gonna the tracks will just take longer and stuff. So we've actually got some really cool uh, collabs with people that I'm really excited about. We've got a track, our next single is a track with Zed's Dead. Nice. And we've got we're working on another track with them, but our next track's with Zed's Dead. We've got something with Kazo. Uh, we're working on a track with Sub Focus, who's a good friend and you know <sighs> that'll be big. And then we're working with a bunch of you know other slightly uh, newer guys. We've got doing a track with Riot, doing a track with Kuro, um, and we've been talking, you know, talking to people like uh, Slushy and Seven Lions about potentially working together. And these are names that a year ago I'd be like, "Wow, no way! Like, they're well, wow, they're well, wow, you're <laughs> And you know, the ZZ guys hit us up and we're like, "Do you want to work on a tune?" And it's out of blue, and it was like, I know they they've always supported our tracks, but yeah. They're great. Um, so that that came, came together quite quickly and organically, and yeah, super proud of that one. It's also a full on uh, drum and bass track. Nice. That's going to work so well in Europe, but they're playing it at all their huge Deadbeats shows. Uh, they've been playing it for like two months now. Right. And so yeah, I mean, we've touched on how drum and bass is not historically done that well in America, and to have th- someone of their status and you know their kind of power, you know, they're they're so big everywhere. Um, it's you know I think that's great for drum and bass and kind of roots super exciting. So just the collabs alone for us means this this next project is just really it just feels for us so different and and fresh. And so yeah, that's I think that's for us the most exciting part of this next project. I love that man, and you can bring those people kind of into your world a little bit too, right? I feel like it pushes yeah. the whole culture. Yeah, forward. exactly. I mean the the Kazo track I was literally working on it this morning with Simon remotely. Um, it literally is. If you could imagine every part of Kazo, every part of Delta Heavy, it's that in a track. It starts off, it goes, it's got his kind of 4 4, slightly hard start influence style, Dro- switches into dubstep. I'm not gonna do it, I can't reveal too much. <laughs> yeah. Then it, it goes into DB at the end, and it's kind of, it's gonna be pretty crazy at the end of it. Um, it's like a melting pot of not just all the things we're influenced by, it's all the things he, he's influenced by. So, yeah, uh, yeah, hopefully, when it's all finished, that's like gonna be super exciting. Man, I'm looking forward to it. That all sounds great. Uh, this has been really fun, man. Thanks for coming yeah, over. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah 100%, yeah. man. No, I, was, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Uh, me too, man. I, I won't make you too late for dinner. Final question. You don't have to think about it very hard. The first thing that pops into your head, uh, a time in your life when music in a moment really affected you deeply. And that could mean anything from, you know, gave you goosebumps or changed the way you th- thought about something. Could be you know, from five minutes ago, could be from your childhood. So the first thing that pops into your head. Okay, well, one thing, because we, 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 we did touch on my boarding school and the fact I used to sneak out to Fabric. One of the times I snuck out to Fabric was this legendary time in kind of drum and bass forums. So Andy C at a True Players Night, and so they had the room one at Fabric, the really cool room with the balcony and the yeah. amazing booth. He was playing the the kind of graveyard shift, but it's it's not graveyard shift where Andy is playing. So I think it was probably playing three thirties or five. Yeah, and Fabric to have a tendency lights go on, people keep playing, and I think you know it's like with Ricardo Villalobos and people they they stay up until like two in the afternoon. But it must have been about five forty, and we were thinking like shit, we need to get the uh, thing about getting the train back before everyone wakes up. Uh, but Andy C 
it was when this seminal drum bass track by Bad Company, like DJ Fresh, uh, probably my favorite ever drum bass tune, a track called Planet Dust. Uh, I think it's from 2003. That's an incredible song. Uh, it was when it was first on dubplate, and he said it's fresh dubplate from Heathman's mastering. And he he literally he drops it his final tune. It must have been about 5:40. Lights been on for 20 minutes. <laughs> I this is before I even touched anything, any drugs. Didn't drink. I was there on like five Red Bulls. Yeah, <laughs> sober, just like just there for the music Wired and up. the fact I was out of school. Yeah, uh, he played Planet Dust his last tune and rewound it five times. And this is like drum bass folklore. And I was like, I was there. Oh, uh, man. So yeah, I, I mean, I'll never forget that. That's a legendary story, yeah. man. I love that. That's perfect. Well, hey, man, this has been great. Uh, thank you again for coming Thanks through. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, 100%, man. Let's do it again after the album drops. Absolutely, I'd love to. All right, man, peace. Thank you. Right, that's the show. Shout out to Delta Heavy. Great to talk to you, man. I hope we catch up some more in LA soon. Make sure to check out their brand new track, Exodus, and make sure to follow them. The link is in the description of this episode so you know exactly when the new album drops next year. Lot to look forward to. My name is Willie Joy. You can also hit me up, backtobackpod at gmail.com is the email address, or you can go to williejoy.com. That's got all my social links, tour dates, you know, all the good stuff. I will see you next week. In the meantime, I'm going to be working on some uh, some cool new stuff for the podcast. I think we're going to, within the next, I'd say, four to six weeks, be doing uh, some kind of live event out in uh, Los Angeles, working on some new ideas for episodes, guests, and continuing to make this show a cool thing for everybody out there. So that's it. I hope you have a great week. Take care of each other. Take some time for yourselves. Chill out. Relax. It'll be okay. For Back to Back, this is Willie Joy. Have a good one. Peace. <laughs>